All right. Good morning, everyone. It's 11 a.m. It's time to get started. Uh, I want to thank everyone for taking the time out of their busy day to join us today. All right. My name is Dennis Riggs. I'm one of the presenters today. I'm the president and CEO of Promotional Spring. Uh, we are located in uh, not so sunny Ohio today, and, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to let Dave talk about the California weather when he gets started. <laughs> but uh, we are we are a print and direct mail provider. Uh, our two biggest verticals would be retail and higher education. We serve many businesses, um, many clients around the country, and, um, and I'm joined today by my friend and our partner uh, David Rosendahl from Mindfire. Um, those of you who are experienced a lot of our marketing, that comes through. Uh, David's company's technology. So I've known David for several years now. Uh, David is sort of out in front of all this stuff, and that's why I invited him to join us today. So welcome, David. Hey, Dennis. Thanks a lot for having me. It's an honor to be here with you and with everyone, and I won't talk about the weather, so uh, we can carry on, and I'm excited to, uh, <laughs> to see what we've got today. <laughs> 50 degrees. That's not cold, Dave. <laughs> All okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So just to I'd like to lay out a quick agenda, we're going to try and answer that question. I think this is going to be one of the questions we're going to try and answer throughout the day. Why direct mail? There are a lot of different choices you have out there as marketers today to get your message out there now more than ever. And why direct mail? Uh, something that is sort of old school. Why should that still be a part? And that's a, that's a, a question like I guess that we're going to attempt to answer throughout the day. Dave's going to take us through some top trends that he sees. Um, and that we see as well things that we can leverage in 2020 because who doesn't want better results in 2020? And then finally, I'll close this up here with some direct mail, some how-to, and some pro tips. And as we went through this today, we've got a lot of information, and we're going to be covering things in a lot of cases at an 80,000-foot level. But those of you, the promotional spring clients and partners who will be receiving our direct mail, or, I'm sorry, our mailbox kit um, after the webinar, and, and we're going to kind of leave that to be a surprise in some cases. Um, but we will take a deeper dive once you receive uh, that kit in the mail. And then finally, like I said, depending on how the time goes, we'll have a Q&A session and obviously we'll wrap it up at the end. All right, so if, uh, you know, I, as we began to prepare for this, you know, if I had been living in a cave for the last 20 years uh, and I came out and I heard how well direct mail is doing, uh, it, it kind of sounds unbelievable. And obviously I've got skin in the game, we do a lot of direct mail here, but it is kind of unbelievable for me to sit here in this day and age when all the different digital channels that we have and, and why is it that direct mail is still relevant? So let's jump in and try to answer that question. And honestly, um, you know, and we're going to see some numbers to back this up, not only is it still relevant, it is actually increasing in effectiveness. Um, and I think that's got a lot to do uh, with a couple different things. We'll cover a couple things today. The first thing I would say would be unique advantages. Um, obviously, each format, each marketing channel has its own set of advantages and disadvantages, but with direct mail, uh, with it being analog in some cases, there are actually still advantages to having to using that, that format. The first thing is it's tangible and portable. I, I see this at my house a lot. Um, a, a lot of the marketing that comes to our house, a lot of it comes from our retail friends that uh, my wife likes to frequent. Um, but that stuff stays around, right? If she, she figures out if she wants to act on that, um, and I see stuff laying around on our counter and on our table uh, for sometimes weeks on end before she will actually act upon that. So uh, by its very nature, it is more tangible, it is more portable, has staying power. Uh, Canada Post uh, sponsored a study, and it was all about cognitive recognition and marketing channels. And what they found with direct mail, a couple of interesting things. 21% of folks uh, found it easier to process. Um, and I think there again, I think that's, sort of part and parcel to the nature of the piece. You know, I know that when I have something important to read, you know, my nature, I print it out, and, and I still have good eyes, by the way. 70% um, of respondents said that direct mail generated better brand recall. And as a marketer, who doesn't want that, right? We're fighting for space, we're fighting for mind share, we're fighting for wallet share, and who does not want better recall? 70% of consumers consider it more personal. And I think we're going to have a number here to sort of explain that. Now, we as marketers know um, it's really not, uh, right? It's just another name on the list, but, but it has that feel, and really how we feel is based, really is, a, is the basis for how we act. 77%, this is according to USPS, and I believe we have some friends from um, USPS joining us today, uh, but 77% of us sort our mail immediately. Um, and, and there again, sometimes obviously it goes in the trash, right? 
But at the same time, even getting noticed can actually contribute to your brand, especially if you have a multi-channel campaign in place. Dave, is this you, by the way? Yeah, how did you get this picture? <laughs> so this is, um, I think, I think you know, we, all, we can all relate here. Uh, we get a lot of email. Uh, I start my day, uh, every day I spend about an hour to 90 minutes at my house and my clients and folks who work at Promotional Spring know that I start early. And a lot of that is sorting through my emails, uh, trying to understand what I've got for that day, what I need to respond to, what, what can I ignore. And, and honestly, I don't get the consumer emails. That, that, in my family, those all sort of go to my wife. Um, I do opt into some of our clients and partners on the consumer side, but th the fact is we, got, we get a lot of email, and it is beginning to affect us. Um, and, and I actually think this number is low. We got these numbers from a company called Edison Software. 51% of us so suffer from email fatigue. Um, I mean, that's, and I, I even talked to uh, a great marketing friend of mine the other day. She even says that she has anxiety sometimes because she, gets, she gets so much email and she's afraid of missing something important. So it's a real issue. Uh, half of us rarely or never even open marketing emails. Um, and I think that, that that third stat sort of backs that up. We've only got so much time. We only have so much energy, right? So 157 emails a day. I happen to get much more than that. Uh, compared to two pieces of direct mail a day. And, and obviously the question becomes is, you know, how much harder is it to sort 157 versus two? And the final stat here, this really has nothing to do with, uh, with, with direct mail's effectiveness, but I just, I just thought it was interesting for us to know that 5% of Americans respond to important emails while intoxicated. So you ever ask that question, hey, is, is this person drunk? One out of 20 times, yes, they are. So, Dave, you're welcome for that. You can use that in your next talk. Okay, thank you. All right, so with direct mail and with any sort of marketing channel, all right, one of the questions we always ask is, what, you know, is the audience right, right? And I think as marketers, we look at this picture, and obviously there's are millennials, and, and, and we look at this sometimes, and I think it's, it's sort of um, cliched in our own mind that millennials would not respond to direct mail. Um, and the truth is, millennials now are actually becoming consumers, right? Uh, the latest study I saw with, you know, depends on, who, you know, who you talk to, who they, how they classify a millennial, but these folks are now 23 to 39 years old. These are folks with spending, right? These are folks that spend. These are people that need, that need uh, our attention as marketers. And direct mail, believe it or not, is actually very effective. Uh, USPS did a study, it's been a couple years ago now, but it really shocked us when it came out because the numbers sort of bear out the fact that, you know, not only is it, it do millennials like direct mail, in a lot of cases it's actually more effective than it is with folks my age, right? Um, 44, I just missed the millennial cutoff um, by, about six, by about six years. But anyway, uh, there are the numbers to back that up. 77% uh, pay attention to it. 90% view it as reliable. I, and I think that reliability issue, that goes back to the fact that, you know, sometimes obviously with email we get spammed. There's plenty of email out there that we can't trust. Uh, a lot of pop-ups, depending on the websites that you go to, uh, ads are very invasive these days. But with direct mail, if somebody spent the time and money to send it, it gives, that, it gives us that feeling of reliability. And then the final number there, 87% like it, right? And who doesn't want a good brand experience, right? Seven out of eight people um, classified as millennials like direct mail. And I think here's the most important thing. Um, why direct mail? Because it works, right? Truth in numbers. I'm a big believer in measurement and results, results-based uh, marketing. Um, and a lot of these numbers here came from the latest uh, response rate from the, from the DMA slash ANA. Um, so those 2018 numbers are actually the latest report. I think they put this out twice, uh, every other year. But the big number that we took away, and we could not believe this, and actually we've talked to our clients about this to make sure that these numbers are bearing out, and most of them agree, response rates have nearly doubled. And that was, that was over a two-year period, 9% versus 5%. And that was with a house list. Uh, direct mail has higher ROI than online display. Right, and obviously, and, and, and let me give you a big caveat here, right? We're talking about digital, and I think Dave's going to go into more depth about that. I am not against digital. 
right? I think digital is, is, is part of a great, um, you know, concerted marketing effort, and direct mail is part of that as well. But I think sometimes the mistake is we rely only upon some of the newer digital channels, and direct mail needs to be a part of that. Um, and actually with ROI, when it comes to ROI with direct mail, ROI is actually growing. It grew 12%. Um, if you look at the numbers, and I would invite you to Google that, uh, it is the number one response medium, right? And, and I think that's important because, you know, email still has the highest ROI, which is great, but what we have talked, when we have talked to our clients, sometimes their email universe simply isn't big enough to, get the, to drive the revenue that they need, um, right? So if my email response is less than half a percent, my direct mail response is 9%, there's a big delta there in terms of the number of responses I need um, to be able to, to drive the revenue that I need for a particular promotion. And finally, um, you know, this is, uh, <laughs> you, you know, the, the old saying, you know, eat your own dog food. You know, we do that. We, we use direct mail in our marketing efforts, um, and we use it successfully. And our clients uh, who use it again and again, um, you know, I had a client the other day tell me that, you know, uh, they do these huge direct mail projects, big retailer, and they talked about it, you know, liking it to actually writing themselves a check, you know, because they knew that revenue was coming based on their experience and based on what they've been doing, and they know that the results are there. So big reason why direct mail, because it works. All right, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dave. All right, Dennis, well, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction. And Dennis, again, thank you for having me here. I really appreciate the time uh, that you're giving me here. And folks, for all of you who are here, um, this is an exciting time uh, to be alive. We've got so many opportunities with uh, direct mail and digital, as Dennis described. There's really a lot going on that you can sink your teeth into here. So when Dennis asked me to join today, he said, you know, Dave, can you talk to us about how direct mail is going to change in 2020 and so it's from that vantage point that I get to talk to you um, today for a few moments. And here at MindFire, we work with all sorts of different clients, uh, just a whole variety of different industries, different shapes and sizes, many of whom rely and love direct mail, rely upon and love direct mail. And so through this work with all sorts of different companies, we get to kind of be on the, uh, the bleeding edge of what people do with direct mail and digital, just as Dennis said a second ago, through the MindFire technology that these organizations use. So I'm really excited to share this with you today. I think that what we're going to cover, my hope is, our hope is, is that it will inspire you to take some action and maybe get you to think a little bit more deeply about how direct mail can play a role in your work, how it can help drive your business forward that may be coming into the hour today with us that you might not have considered. Does that sound good? So that's, that's what my hope is today. So now what I'm gonna share with you is the view that I have here through the lens that, that MindFire has about the world, okay? Of where things might be going in 2020. And it's grounded in both the reality of being a day-to-day -day practitioner of this stuff, as well as kind of prognostication about what's going to happen based on all of the different things that we get to see from our seat here at MindFire. Okay, so I, I like to say that we're both in the clouds kind of at the high level, but we're also very much in the dirt um, as, it, as it relates to having our hands in both the future as well as the day-to-day, -day, okay? So as I look in the crystal ball and as I try to connect all of these dots for you, I'm gonna try to give you what I think, what we think is right around the corner that you can put your, your hands around, okay? So first, by the numbers, if we ask ourselves why we should reconsider direct mail, why we should look at it perhaps a bit differently, it ties back to what Dennis said a second ago. The world has become increasingly digital, right? You don't need me to tell you that. You know that. But it's because direct mail is now adapting to the digital world, meaning that it, it works better with digital stuff. I'm going to show you some examples here in a second. It's because of that that it's become very interesting, ROI positive in ways that it hasn't before. So in this study, uh, marketing decision makers, if you look at the screen, take a look at the screen there. Marketing decision makers were surveyed and folks calculated a 40% conversion rate when digital and direct mail are combined. I want to know from you, go over to the chat box, 40% conversion rate, is that higher or lower than what you're currently getting? I wanna make sure you're awake and interactive. Go over to the chat box and let us know. 40%, is that higher or lower than what you're currently getting? 
68% of these folks that were surveyed said that combining digital and direct mail drove more website traffic to a landing page, to a microsite, to a Perl, things that Dennis and his team do. And 60% said uh, that combining digital and direct mail increased ROI. Okay, I'm seeing people say that 40% is much higher, 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 higher. Yeah, one person says lower. Well, fantastic, you're doing well there, uh, Steve. But yes, that is, that's awesome. Now, since Dennis uh, snuck into my office and took that picture, I also snuck into his inbox. Dennis, I, I hacked you this morning. And when you, were talking about, <laughs> when you were talking about how many emails you get, you're not kidding, right? You've got 5,376,354 in your inbox. Yeah, I haven't checked it since Tuesday. Yeah, exactly. Now, I'm sure there's no customer emails there waiting, but the point of this is to underscore exactly what Dennis said, that in part, direct mail is much more relevant and is cutting through the clutter because of the onslaught of digital channels like email, right? Now, the key that we're talking about today is that these things, when working together, are extremely powerful. USPS, of course, has also realized this, the United States Postal Service. I see that I have Sean and others that are dialing in from other parts of the world, um, so the same is true in other parts of the world, but today we're talking about the USPS specifically. They've realized that mail needs to stay relevant, and they're making substantial, very large and significant investments in making direct mail relevant in the digital age. Of course, that's to their benefit, but one of the things that they're doing, and this is one of the key ideas I want to give you that hopefully sparks some new opportunities, folks. Look at the screen. Look at the screen. You might be familiar with this both as a consumer of direct mail or uh, uh, as a producer of it. It's called informed delivery. Okay, if you're, if you're taking notes, write down informed delivery. And we predict that informed delivery is only going to increase in prominence in 2020. So now's a really, time, a really good time to consider how you can use it. Let me, let me tell you what this is about if you're not familiar with it. The thing that's cool about informed delivery is that it allows you as a company trying to connect with your customer, with your prospects through direct mail, it allows you to connect that direct mail with digital, okay? And so what this does is it gives your customers, the people that you're sending mail to, a daily preview of their mail. Okay, so it shows the exterior image of the mail piece, either in email, that's how my wife gets it. Uh, she gets a daily email. Uh, they also have a, an app that you can put on your phone. And they also have an online dashboard where you can go and look. Okay, so what happens is as the mail is on its way to your customer, to your prospect, to your, to your audience, they're getting a notification in email or in this online app or in their dashboard that something is on, their, uh, is on its way and they can see the front of that mail piece. In addition, in that little preview, you can um, incorporate what's called a ride along, a digital ride along, which allows you to then link that person to your website, to a social channel, maybe to an app or a video, something else online. Does that make sense? I want to go over and drop a yes in the chat box if this is something that, that resonates with you. Is this making sense how you can connect direct mail with digital? So at a, at a high level, this is the picture, right? The direct mail piece is sent. You have an opportunity to include that digital preview with that right along content. The direct mail piece hits. And then here in this example, we're saying now you have another opportunity to drive somebody into a physical location. A lot of you have retail locations, you have stores that you want to drive people to, but it doesn't only have to be physical. It can also drive um, electronic digital interaction, right? The key here is if you think about this is that you're getting a triple impression through this, okay? Because they're interacting with the mail piece, uh, with the preview and with whatever it is that you're linking them to. So this gives you valuable data, things like how many people are opening their emails, their click rates, all of the things like that, that are essential for us as marketers to key in as to how things are doing. Uh, as I talk to my friends at USPS, they're telling me that somewhere around 68% of these notifications are opened daily. Pretty remarkable. Now, the, the super sweet thing about this is that currently through the USPS, and folks, this isn't going to be like this forever. So now is the time to get on board, but this is free. Okay, only 2,000-ish companies, meaning brands like yours, are using this right now. 20 million consumers um, are on board, and it, this number is climbing every week. But this is something that is still kind of like the, the – you're getting it at the ground level if you can figure out how to incorporate this. Dennis and his team can help you with this. Now, I know that some of you are thinking, well, Dave, it sounds cool what you're talking about but I'm still not really convinced that direct mail is able to do all of this stuff and drive digital actions, okay? Tell me more about how this is happening. So I pulled some numbers here together for you. And what you're looking at here on the screen is a study that the USPS did um, of marketing decision makers when they were probed about what kinds of results they're getting by using direct mail 
along with digital, okay? And so here's what they said. 68% said that it's driving more web traffic. About the same number said it's lifting response rates. 60% said it's increasing ROI. 53% said it's increasing leads. 39% said it's driving more physical uh, uh, traffic to a store, to a business location. And 11% said that it's increasing downloads. Now, when you ask these same folks what this kind of digital interaction with direct mail does in their marketing funnel from a marketing perspective. They're saying 51% said it's driving more awareness, 68% said it's driving consideration, 52% said it's causing transactions, and you can see some of the other stats there as well. Now, just the other day, as I was showing this to somebody, um, they said, okay, wait, can you, can you tell me more about what you mean when you say that direct mail with digital is causing these results? Specifically, what are people doing? So here's seven things that folks are doing that I think as you look forward to 2020, you should be considering, okay? So this is how companies are coordinating direct mail and digital campaigns. 80% are driving traffic from that direct mail piece to a digital channel. 76% are incorporating a Perl or an eq URL or some sort of discount code in the direct mail so that it becomes much more trackable. 61% are timing their digital media with that direct mail, similar to what I showed you a second ago. 51% are sending direct mail based on an online behavior. I'm gonna show you that in a second. 49% are creating a digital version of that direct mail and sending it through something like email. And 15 and 7% respectively are using QR codes and AR in the direct mail. Now I wanna to talk to you about QR and AR because that's something I think you need to very carefully consider in 2020. I'm sure many of you are familiar with QR codes, right? When I got to that part in the list, I'm sure many of you said, okay, yeah, I know what a QR code is. Now, the thing that has changed here is that for many phones, in fact, the phone that I'm holding in my hand next to me here, the QR code reader is now built into the phone, meaning all you have to do is take your camera, which all of us can do very easily, and point it at the QR code, like you see here on the right-hand side, and it will automatically open uh, a little interface that says, what do you want to do with what's embedded in the QR code? Most of the time, it's a link to something, right? If you think back to when QR codes kind of came on the scene, if you recall, you had to go download a QR code reader. It was clunky. It caused friction. They didn't always work. They were a pain in the butt. They weren't all the same. But now the phones have this built in. So now it is very easy to jump to, to, to URLs, to pearls, um, all sorts of things online with very little friction from the direct mail to the web. I wanna know if you just had an aha moment with that. Go over to the chat box and drop an X if this is something that was new to you. Not very many people know that it's built in right to the camera these days, making it very simple for you to get folks to the web. Go drop an X, yeah, cool, I'm seeing Xs come in. Now, in addition to QR, AR is something that we're seeing a lot more of. AR uh, stands for uh, augmented reality, okay? And what augmented reality does is it allows you to, this is still a little ways out there, but it allows you to, if you have an app, if your brand has an app, to enable the consumer, the person who has their app, has that app on their phone, to point it at something in real life and see something kind of superimposed on real life. Let me see if I can show you an example of what I mean here. I'm gonna bring up a, um, a YouTube video here. And as it's playing, you're gonna take a look at uh, QR in real life. So this is something that Coca-Cola is doing for the holidays. And what happens is you download the Coca-Cola app or you already have it on your phone if you're like my wife, <laughs> she's got it. You point it at the Coke can and it comes to life. You can see bears and polar bears throwing snowballs at each other, all these cool things, right? As you can see here on the screen. So this is something that allows you to make um, physical life, real life out there, uh, you know, interactive. And if you think about how you can do this with direct mail, it means that somebody could interact with your direct mail with the stuff that you've printed for them in ways that they've never been able to before. So that's something that I think you really should think about. Now, in addition to like United States Postal Service and these organizations that I've talked to you about that are uh, incorporating direct mail into the mix. Um, Facebook is also doing some really cool stuff. Let me show you what Facebook is doing to help you here. Did you know that you can take your direct mail list? Dennis and his team can do this for you. And with that list of folks that you want to direct mail, you can actually warm that list up on Facebook. You can match those people up on Facebook. 
so that you can create digital impressions on Facebook, for example, in advance of the direct mail piece hitting home or right around the time the direct mail piece hits home. So in doing that, you're creating another impression that's warming that audience up to drive the action that you're looking for on Facebook, on direct mail, in your physical store location. Very, very powerful. Data. Most people don't know you can Just do one, one now, in data. What you can do is you can leverage the big data that Facebook has on all of us, right? I, I believe there's something like 50,000 other points of data that Facebook has on people like you and me. And with that information, once your direct mail list is uploaded, Facebook can now find other people that look like that. And you can extend the reach of what you're doing to other lookalike consumers. So very, very powerful stuff. And with Facebook's AI, not only can you start to put impressions in front of them, but you can say to Facebook, look, what I want you to do is to find people. I kind of want you to sort who you're showing this stuff to so that, for example, I can drive more traffic. Or maybe you want to get people to generate leads. Or maybe you want to start conversations and, and, and do messages. Facebook can basically start to sort that audience so that in, a, in addition to the direct mail piece hitting them, they're also showing impressions to the people who are most likely to do the thing you want to do, drive traffic to a store, uh, increase brand awareness, et cetera. Really, really powerful. Now I'm hearing, um, I'm hearing my YouTube back here, so I'm going to turn that off and uh, bring the presentation back up because I don't want to get distracted by the music there. So that's Facebook, some incredible functionality that they can provide you. One more thing I want to show you here, it's called intent data. This is wild. Intent data um, is essentially a new branch of uh, kind of AI and big data that as marketers, we're just starting to get our arms around. The basic idea is this, folks. If you could imagine that you were able to look over the shoulder of your customers and your prospects and watch what they're doing online across all sorts of different websites. And if you could be listening for you know, certain keywords, certain events they're attending, um, and if you could enrich that with who they are in the organization, how big the company is, if, if you're interested in B2B uh, uh, folks, or even B2C. And then if you could somehow know who those people were and, and, and kind of group them into you know, perhaps accounts that you wanna break into, uh, maybe existing customers, uh, new accounts that you want to get into. If you could somehow look over the shoulder of, of your audience, of your tribe in that way, as they're downloading white papers, going to webinars like the one today, searching, et cetera, well, by then, you know, you would have some remarkable insight into who prospective clients are, who are people that might be interested in your service. So intent data is the word, is the term that describes your ability to suck in that information and then to use that as a marketer, as a sales organization to then follow up. And so imagine being able to gather these signals and then use direct mail and some of these other digital touch points to engage that particular person. Very, very powerful. Now, I see in one of the comments here, somebody's mentioning some of the USPS promos that they have special programs available. Uh, I can't see who said that, it went by too quickly, but you're right. As you're thinking about all of these different things that we just discussed here, um, USPS is allowing you to save money on postage when you do many of these things. So now is a great time to think about 2020, think about how you're gonna work with Dennis and his team. Uh, those, those promos are in the final stages of being approved by the United States Postal Service. Um, and, and talking to folks there, it's likely that it's going to include what I'm showing you here on the screen, meaning discounts for uh, trans promotional uh, color uh, tactile, sensory, and interactive mail pieces like the ones I showed you a second ago. There's a mobile, mobile shopping uh, discount and emerging and advanced technology. All of the stuff that we talked about today is likely to fit into one of these categories and the, the, the savings are significant. So now is a good time to consider how you might be able to do this to drive more uh, results for, for your brand. So in summary, this is what I'm seeing as we look ahead to 2020. Mail is definitely cool again. Um, it's definitely something that more and more organizations are using. Informed delivery, that service from the United States Postal Service, it's growing rapidly. As we look at customers who are combining direct mail and digital, it's driving real results. Uh, QR codes, like I showed you, yes, you, you, you've probably seen them before, but now there's a resurgence and they're becoming much more effective and much more prominent uh, across a variety of different organizations. Technologies like augmented reality, like that Coke example I showed you, are making mail interactive. Companies like Facebook, and Google are also technologies that we can use to warm up direct mail and make it more effective. 
intent data, which is pulling from, you know, reams and reams of data out there on the web is helping us target people at just the right time through electronic channels as well as through digital. And as you consider these things, USPS is making it advantageous for us to tap into these trends by providing postage discounts. So I want to know before I turn it over back to Dennis here of these six things that I've talked about today, informed delivery, QR codes, augmented reality, uh, using Facebook to warm up your direct mail, intent data number five, six, uh, saving money on postage. Go over to the chat box, drop me a number. Which one, we want to know, which one are you most excited to buy? All right, give me a one through six. Uh, I'm going to give you 10 seconds. I want to see those numbers pouring in. I see five, so that's intent data. I see two and four QR codes and Facebook. I see three, three, six, one and two. I see a bunch of ones coming in. That's interesting, Dennis. Three, five. Okay, I'm going to give you five more seconds, folks. Give me your number. I want to know one through six, what you see there on the screen. Dennis, um, I'm going to turn it back over to you in about five seconds here. Thank you, William, uh, Andrew, John, Tom, uh, Jane. I'm looking over here at Facebook. Sean, I want to see your number, Sean. Uh, what, what are you thinking? I got Sean Daney and Sean Concanon both on Facebook. I want to know from both Sean's. All right, thank you, Richard. All right, Dennis, I'm gonna turn it back over to you here, uh, but folks, if you've got any questions or wanna follow up with us on this, Dennis is gonna put our contact information at the end again. That's my email there on the screen. Love talking to you about anything related to the material today. And Dennis, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Um, so Dave, great job. And, and I wanna add one thing. Uh, you talked about Facebook. We deal with a lot of companies, a lot of big brands, and obviously they've got their own social, social media department or team or whatever it might be. And they don't know about this. They don't know that you can take this. When we talk about a custom audience, they think about doing lookalikes, right? And they don't know that you can take your direct mail list and upload that to Facebook and, and have this kind of success. And Absolutely. in fact, we had one, we had one client, um, and they took they had 800,000 people on their list. They took 100,000 the first time they did it, and they uploaded that list to Facebook, and they they doubled their response within the, within that set of 100,000. So that is more than statistically significant. And it's just kind of marketing 101, right? If it's good to see the message once, it's good to see it multiple times. So this stuff actually works. Um, and we've got a lot of clients that we're partnering with to do that today. All right, so I want to close up with a little bit of practicality, right? So Dave's gone out in the future, and he talks about being in the, in the day to day. And this is something I want to make sure that, that we take with us today. Because as, as I went through this, I know we've got a lot of uh, great and experienced marketers on the call with us today. Um, I've been doing mail in some part or another for the last 25 years. And as I went through this, you know, I thought, you know what, I need to make sure that we as a company, we as our team with our own marketing and when we are helping with our clients' marketing, need to be more intentional to make sure that we, when we do a direct mail program, whether it's a standalone or a digital with email, whatever it might be, that we do it right. So took a few minutes and just kind of broke it down into five steps. First thing we want to think about is planning and timing. Um, if, if you don't take anything from this, take away this first bullet point. Make sure that you communicate. Uh, we see this a lot, um, especially with bigger teams. And sometimes, unfortunately, they're right down the hall. But if folks don't know the entirety of the program in terms of what data are we going to be leveraging, what data do we need to leverage in the creative, what is the message, uh, what should the list look like, who should the list include, who should the list not include, um, communication, right? Make sure that everyone's on the same page before you hit the launch button. Uh, I would recommend you start six to eight weeks, weeks from the end home. Uh, most of the marketing mail that we do, it's, it's, we still call it standard mail, unfortunately, USPS folks, but USPS now calls it marketing mail. Um, you need to allow a couple of weeks, generally speaking, to get that in home. And we do some things, sometimes that might even take a little bit longer, including Copal. Um, so make sure that you start early and start with that in home date. If you, if you come to us and say you want to run a direct mail program, that's going to be the first question we ask, what's the in home? And then basically we'll, we will help you plan it from there. Um, Know the postage, right? When you get your print quote, uh, don't let it just say plus postage unless postage has an estimate. Uh, once you get into larger mailings, right, uh, we see economies of scale of print where the cost goes down as the number of unit, uh, units increase. But with postage, you can get, obviously, you do get uh, discounts with pre-sorting and things like that, but only to a certain point. And it gets to the point of mailings of 10, 20,000 and above where postage can be 60% of the budget. So make sure you know that number to put into that line item. It's very important. Dave's talked about this. Measure it. Uh, QR codes, um, trackable phone numbers, campaign-specific URLs. If you, have been, if you have experienced any of our own marketing, uh, we typically use a campaign-specific URL to go to a microsite to drive some kind of action, and sometimes that comes in the form of a generic URL. Um, think, about the, think outside the mailbox.com. We had a lot of folks come in through that generic URL today, 
and then folks that were on our list came in specifically through a pearl, a personalized URL. So we added someone's name to the front of that. Um, that, that seemed like it was a little passe for a while, but in recent years we've had very good success using personalized URLs. Coupon codes uh, for our retail partners out there. Um, we've got a lot of folks now that are going to serialize coupon codes that are down to the recipient. So, the, so at the point of sale, they can be very accurate knowing that, the, you know, hey, this is Dave Rosendahl, and, and it pulls up all of your customer information from the CRM. Calls to action, right? Sometimes calls to action can be unique to the direct mail piece. And, and finally, a control group. If, you're lar if you have a large enough mail list, we always recommend leaving the control group out, especially if you're running a campaign over multiple channels, to see how much attribu attribution we can get uh, from that direct mail response, right? To see if direct mail is in fact providing a lift. And finally, if, if you've got questions, ask. And, 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 we, and we, we try to encourage our clients and partners to ask early on, right? Don't tell us when you've got everything ready to go. The better conversation is, hey, we're thinking of running this campaign in a couple of months. What do you think we can do um, to, to increase the response rate? What can we do to increase that ROI? The list. Um, fundamental to the success of your campaign. Um, you know, we're going to ask that question in the beginning. Is this a house list, right? Is this your list of current customers? Is it a prospect list? Do you need to purchase a prospect list? Do we? Or is it going to be both? In some cases, we do. And obviously, you should segment the list and make sure that you know, um, is, it a house, is it someone from the house list or is it a prospect? And if you don't know what your prospect list looks like, if you don't know where to start, start by profiling your list, right? Your, your first best customer is your current customer. Your second best customer are the lookalikes. And, and Dave already talked about that with Facebook. <clears throat> but if you don't know the demographic data, and especially if you're a retail company, if you don't know the demographic data, uh, we can actually take your list and have a demographic profile built, and it comes at a very low cost. And what that allows you to do is know when I go out for, with my other marketing efforts, if that's purchasing a list or social media or whatever, you can know who your, who your demographics are. Uh, a big thing that we're finally seeing people leverage more and more today is actionable CRM data. Um, I feel it, it's my opinion that this data has been sitting around for a long time. Uh, with many clients and, and many marketers and not being used, but we are seeing it now finally used more and more. Um, so what can, you know, what can you get from your CRM that is actionable, right? Purchase behavior, purchase history, um, life cycle, right? If it's, if it's a life cycle type of product, where are they at in the life cycle of that product? And your CRM, if done well, should give you those answers. If you don't have a good CRM, your data can be appended, right? If you're just getting started with CRM, um, data services that we use, I can actually take your list and append uh, demographic and sometimes psychographic data to that. We have ran campaigns for people using personalized URLs and generic URLs to gather marketing intelligence, communications, emails, all those different things. Um, and that stuff can be actually pushed back into your CRM. Right? So if you don't have that CRM, if you don't have the good data that you need, there are ways to add that in. Uh, segment and personalize. Um, th this is something that is very important in the list stage, right? You need to make sure that you have those data points that allow you to do this, right? Because sometimes we get people, they pull information from, from their CRM, from wherever it is they house their data, and they don't include those, those key data points that we're going to need to segment and personalize. Because the bottom line is you're, you should want to speak differently to your different market segments, right? Classic example would be a bank or a financial institution. Borrowers and savers, right? If I'm at the point in my life where I'm saving as opposed to borrowing, why are you going to send me something about a mortgage loan, right? Um, and then personalize. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But it needs to not only go down to the segment, but down to the individual, if at all possible. The offer and call to action. If you're not sure, test it. Um, a lot of our clients and partners use digital as a great means of testing to figure out which offer moves the needle, right? Your offer and call to action should be clear and concise. Um, it's, it's not war and peace. We don't have to give them uh, 25 different reasons why they should act. We need to give them one or maybe two. It needs to be consistent with your omnichannel experience. I've got a great friend who happens to be a great marketer, and she talks about if we are inconsistent, right, in terms of the messaging that we offer uh, to our clients, to our prospects, if we are inconsistent across channels, we risk alienating or even losing that customer. And, and that's that stuck with me because um, you think about it, if, you've, you know, if you get that direct mail piece <clears throat> and you come into a retail establishment and you don't see any evidence of that sale, it, it's, a, it's a little disconcerting. So make sure that your offer and call to action is consistent with what you're doing in digital channels. Because like, you know, like Dave's been talking about here, 
you know, hopefully you're not just running direct mail by itself. As much as I would love you, uh, love for you to send us your direct mail by itself, I am hopeful that you are including this as a, in a coordinated effort with your digital experience. How relevant can you be, right? We, you know, the, the image here shows us uh, several different offers. You know, and, and the idea here is, and we talked about this with segmentation, offers, we should have different offers for different segments. We should have different offers for different individuals, right? And the question is, how relevant can you be? This really comes into play during the planning process. Um, this is an old school thing, but we still get this question a lot. Hey, you know, which, which matters the most, right? Which matters the most? Is it, is it my list? Is it the offer? Is it the creative? It's 40-40-20, right? List and offer are the most important to your success. This is where you need to spend the time. This is where you need to spend the money. This is where you need to do the testing. And finally, uh, marketing fundamentals, as I always say, always apply, right? We gotta have, we, it's got to be the right time, right? We've got to have the right audience, and we've got to have the right offer. You know, if you, send me a, you, could send me a great, you could send me a great deal on a car. Um, I like the cars that they drive better than me, but anyway. Um, you could send me a great offer in a car, but if, on a car, but if I am not in the market, it, it doesn't matter, right? And, and maybe that's where we can leverage some of that intent data that they talked about earlier today. Final piece, I shouldn't say the final piece, uh, the big three, though, creative and format. Test the creative and get creative, right? I think the creative, and, and we do a lot of A-B testing for clients if they're not sure. You can test this on a small scale. This was a, a conference I went to several years ago, and I have found it to be true, and we've kind of tested it again and again with our clients. But if you know about what your response rate is, whether you're testing creative, a list, or whatever, whatever have you, and you feel like you can get 100 responses, that is statistically significant of the larger audience 80% of the time. Hopefully that makes sense, but basically get 100 responses, whatever you think it takes to get 100 responses, that should predict how that, how that, you know, that change or whatever it is that you've affected will affect the, the broader audience 80% of the time, right? Refreshing creative and mixing formats can mitigate mail fatigue. Um, a lot of stuff we're going to go into in our mailbox kit um, that we're going to send out to our clients and partners at the end um, about different formats and things like that. But if we're continually doing the same thing, you know, if it's letter after letter after letter or postcard after postcard after postcard, it's just like it's, it becomes like email. Eventually it becomes white noise and people begin to tune that out. So if you are seeing uh, slippage in your response rate, that might be something to consider. Does the, does the creative need refreshed? Does, does the actual mailing format need to be refreshed, right? And test it. Um, so those things can mitigate fatigue. Um, our friends at the USPS will tell you it must meet their guidelines. You cannot just send any kind of direct mail you want, unfortunately. And we've and those of us in the mail business, we've all got a story, um, or, or you know w that involves us personally or something we've heard about. I recently heard about a million dollar plus mistake on, on a sweepstakes program. I had nothing to do with, but it just scared me to death to hear that. But if you don't do this, if you don't, you know, if you're your aspect ratio is wrong, the material that you're using is wrong, uh, the mail panels is formatted incorrectly, you can end up paying a lot of money because of that mistake. So make sure that your USPS guidelines are met. We have a couple folks on staff here at Promotional Spring, uh, plus me, who knows enough to be dangerous, uh, who are very well versed in mail piece design. Ask those questions early on. Hey, we're thinking about doing something new. Will this work, right? And then if we have a question, we, we just we literally drive it right up to the post office and begin to ask them. So. And sometimes they have to ask folks too. So anyway, so but make sure, especially with any large scale mailing, that those USPS guidelines are met. And actually in the spirit of Dave here, if anybody's got their worst um, nightmare about how these things have happened and how much money it's cost them and they don't care to divulge that, put that in the chat box there, awesome. uh, right now. Yeah, very cool. All right. And, and finally, I, I know, you, you know, I, I, I'm a former creative. I, I did creative here years ago and I was so bad at it I got promoted. Um, so, so uh, believe me, I'm, I'm a big fan of creative and I can still speak your language, but just know this, even the best creative cannot overcome a bad offer or a bad list. And finally, um, the action plan, you know, and, and we see this a lot with direct selling, but where people fall down is there is no concerted effort to follow up on leads, right? You know, we do we do direct mail as lead generation, and we see those leads die sometimes. And, and I'll admit, in the past, we've done it here as well. We try to do a much better job of that today. Um, you can actually plan triggered and automated follow-ups to help that. We do that a lot with our technology, and we can help you with that. 
take some of that out of the hands of your sales professionals. And then the next thing, the last piece of this, uh, post-mortem. Uh, Dave, do you guys do post-mortems? Oh, yeah, all the time. It's it, it, very helpful, right? What do we learn from that? And, and, and it's important that you do it. I know we're all busy, but it's important that you do it in the direct aftermath, take notes, and understand from this what is next and what should we do differently next time. Because even the best campaigns, there, there's just about always something you can do better. All right, I'll speed up here. Um, pro tips and creative uses. It, it, I, this to me is the most important thing, right? This beyond using this with digital, make sure that it's personalized. Uh, we had one client who added simple name personalization to one side of the mail piece. They saw 27% increase in response. And we see the numbers here to bear that out, right? 57% of folks say they are okay with us using their personal data if it helps them, right? If, it's, if it saves time. 87% uh, more likely to respond to a personalized offer. Those of you in the B2B world, 94% of B2B buyers choose companies who they feel have a better understanding of them. And what better way to demonstrate that than, than getting something personalized in direct mail? Lift with personalization. Uh, and the metal bullet point here is, is to me the biggest thing. People are willing to pay more for a personalized experience. People are willing to pay more for a personalized experience. This happened to me yesterday, and, and actually, to, I guess today, I found this, I found this this morning um, <laughs> on, my, uh, on the breakfast table. Uh, but personal touches make us feel valued. And here's what I found. Uh, my wife brought this to my attention this morning. My daughter, our trash was picked up. We have trash picks up, pick up on, Wednesday, on Wednesdays. This was stuck to our dumpster. And, and this, is, uh, this is probably not on brand, and I apologize if we've got any rusty people here. Please don't get on to Ken for this. But, but look at what this guy did. He stuck this to our dumpster. Happy holidays from my family to yours from your rumpy garbage collector, Ken. Wow. Now, that, that is something now, you know, I know that this guy, you know, it made me think a lot of him that he took the time. He probably sat at home on his personal computer paying, you know, eight bucks a sheet for ink on his inkjet printer or whatever it is. But he took the time, and it actually made me feel valued. Um, a pretty cool little experience. And I think we as marketers, if we do personalization right, that's the kind of feeling we can get that we can emote in our, in our clients and prospects, right? And who doesn't want that? So creative uses, and, and I wanted to, and, and there again, we had so many things to cover today. Dimensional direct mail for high value targets. Um, I wouldn't recommend this if you're selling pizzas across town, but in one case we had a, a company we did work for, they were selling to oil and natural gas, and these were multi-million dollar prospects. We sent out a nice box. They had great results from that, created meetings. Uh, retargeting and shopping cart abandonment, we're, also, we're all used to Google and um, Amazon following us all over the Internet. Hey, you know, when, when are you going to buy this? And we, we saw it in your shopping cart. Uh, we're actually using direct mail to help our clients use that today, and the results have been staggering. 60% increase in response doing that. Loyalty and lead gen, event marketing, I think email is great for that. But in, in the same thing with a nurturing sequence, especially if you are in that sequence already with your client or prospect, but a key touch along the way is direct mail we find gives a great result. And Dave's already talked about this at length, the driving online interaction uh, with direct mail. I, I follow a guy um, on YouTube, Andrew Davis, and um, met him at a conference a couple years ago, and he talks about the loyalty loop and how he owned a very large uh, direct marketing company, a digital, a digital company, as a matter of fact, and their results really skyrocketed when they turned to print, when they turned to direct mail to continue that conversation online. And obviously, whatever else you have, just ask. We love a challenge. We love something new, and we will certainly give you our best effort and thoughts uh, to go into that. So closing thoughts, and we'll be done. Uh, first thing, uh, you know, sometimes we get, I, I feel like we see all these things and all these technologies, and, and, you know, and it's kind of where do I start? And here's the truth of the matter. Even the biggest and best brands that we deal with, I wouldn't say that, and I think they would tell you the same thing if they're honest. Nobody has it figured out. This is constantly evolving, and Dave kind of shared with that, you know, all the different things that we, you know, we don't have experience with. You know, we get fearful of that, um, but, the, but the truth is nobody has it figured out. Start with your CRM, as we talked about, and then, and then start with the experience you want your customers to have across channels, right? I, I'm a big believer in reverse engineering, you know, and trying to create that experience and then beginning to plug in those pieces. This is where digital fits. This is, where online, this is where online display fits. This is where my direct mail fits, right? But start with the experience you want them to have, and I, and I would urge you again to make sure that is a personalized one, make sure that is relevant. Um, avoid one and done. And I'm just going to say this the most tactful way I can. 
but but have the guts to do it. Have the have the guts to go beyond sending that one postcard or one email or one anything for that matter, right? Avoid one and done. We 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 rarely ever see people hit a home run with just one marketing effort. And finally, uh, promotional spring clients and partners, look for your mailbox kit in early January. Um, I think that some of that stuff's been shared over social media. We're going to kind of keep it under wraps, let it be a surprise, but you will get your Y Direct mail, um, infographic, your how to guide, and then uh, various formats for inspiration, all included in, a, in what we think is a pretty cool package. All right. Maybe just have a few minutes for QA, Dave. Yeah, yeah, Dennis, we have, um, I got about 12 questions here, so hopefully everyone can spend a few minutes past uh, the hour here. Uh, I still see pretty much everybody on, so Dennis, I'm going to fire these off to you, and if you want me to take one of them, just let me know. Um, there were a couple questions around it, whether or not the Canadian Post offers anything like informed delivery, and I think, Dennis, you said you and your team are going to look into that. Is that right? That's right. We, yeah, we, we will check into that. Okay. Uh, to be have... honest with you, I don't know. We, we mail into Canada. Uh -huh. But that, that goes through a partner, so but we will check into that. Okay. Uh, from Caressa, and uh, folks, forgive me if I mispronounce your name, doing my best here. Uh, wondering, Dennis, what do you see in terms of direct mail and text messaging, direct mail and SMS? You know, we, we have seen, I, I guess with us, we've had very little experience with that. I know that we have people that have sent direct mail um, with, with, a, with a text message opt-in. Um, and, and, and in some cases, we don't see the results of that I know, but I have, I know, Dave. I know you guys use it. Yeah, I, I we mean, do. Maybe you can speak that a little better, a little better than I could. Yeah, we do. So, um, in general, one of the easiest kind of things to think about, Caressa, is. Uh, providing a way for folks to simply reply to the direct mail if it's a direct response type campaign uh, by texting a keyword of some sort to a short code uh, that begins that electronic communication through SMS. So, Chris, if you've got more questions, we can follow up on that. Um, I'm just going to try to go as quickly as I can here so we hit everybody's uh, key question. Uh, Facebook folks, so Sean and Kelsey and others that are there, please let us know if you have questions. I've got that open as well and I can see your questions. So, uh, Dennis, Rich at uh, uh, Infovine was saying, can we get a copy of the presentation? And a bunch of other people jumped on that. So yes, Dennis, I think we're making this available after, as you said. Yeah, um, we'll make it available for download. Let's turn, let me turn this one from Steve over to you, Dennis. He's saying, what is the best way to generate more leads from direct mail? What are your thoughts on that? I, I think I, I, that's a great question. I, I think that is that would be more campaign specific. But, but, I, but the two big things that we preach, we, we preach, you know, Coordinate this with digital. Make part of an omni effort. That would be the big thing. And then secondly, the personalization piece. What do we know? What can we leverage? What can we do to grab their attention, right? And if you do that, if you do that properly, that, that won't just apply with the direct mail. It will also apply with the, with the email as well. Uh, I'll throw one in there for you, Steve. Steve, hopefully you're still here. Go to the chat box if you are, Steve. I want to make sure you're still here. But one of the things that I see uh, some of our more successful partners and clients doing is, uh, for example, if they've got a URL or a pearl on that direct mail piece and they're leading folks to a landing page or a microsite, you know, not everybody who gets to that landing page converts, right? Let's say you do well and you get a 50% conversion on that landing page. What are you doing with that other 50%? If you're using tracking technology like uh, Dennis and his team can apply, then that 50% is a group that you can retarget and re-nurture. Uh, Dennis may have their yeah. email. They can create up automated systems to follow up with what we generally call no action folks, no action triggers. So there's a lot that you can do to squeeze more out of the direct mail uh, if you're combining it with other channels. Did you want to add something there, Dennis? No, I, I think that's that, that, say that's great because you know if you've got a follow-up plan in place, you know, you, you know, cold calling is one thing, warm calling is another, right? And that's I think that's what you're getting at. Those are the folks you want to follow up with, yep. whether it's a phone call, an email, another direct mail touch, whatever it is. Because the idea is, you know, with a, with a lot of this, is you just want to be there when they when they finally raise their hand, right? And and there again, that's that's kind of you, you got to have the guts to to stay with it. But, but that's what you got to be able to do is you got to be able to, to, to make sure you're following up with those warmer leads. So another question here, and I don't uh, know the name, but somebody's asking what percent of the target list is linkable in Facebook? So I think what they mean here is if you're doing direct mail with Facebook, what percentage mm -hmm. of the list are you finding available on Facebook? So Dennis, what's your thought on that? And then I can, I can add so, if you want. So we don't see, I, you know, and Jason, Jason is here with me, and I, he can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think with a lot of the change in data in Facebook's policies, we don't see – an actual percentage anymore, but typically speaking, it was you know 60 to 80 percent. And I'll say this: I do know this, and Jason's nodding his head in agreement. But I do know this: you you need to have the email address. 
um, that that really drives the, the the match rate. And Dave, I don't know if you've got anything to add. Absolutely. 60 to 80 percent is right in line with what we see. Facebook has made more attributes available for matching folks, um, so it continues to improve. But it is a very, very high percentage. And Facebook, we, I just use that as one example. You know, you can also do the same with Google. Uh, we can help you do the same with LinkedIn. Uh, mm -hmm. All of the networks out there are making something like that available. Uh, somebody is asking here, in order to do the, the Facebook digital plus direct mail uh, type of campaign, how difficult is it to set that up and what do you need? Dennis, what are your thoughts? How difficult is it to set up? Um, it's not that bad. I mean, essentially, we would need uh, access as an admin user to your ad account, your Facebook uh, business account. Um, and then essentially, we can take it from there and we upload the list and we time the ads. And essentially, uh, Jason, if I'm wrong here, but essentially to the user in a lot of cases, it's to approve the ads and set the budget. Dave, okay. anything else to add there? Nope. Nope. That's, that's at a high level what needs to happen. Um, a related question is, with so many options to consider, where's the best place to start with a direct mail campaign? <laughs> I, I think it's, I, I think it's, you, you know, start with the goals, right? What do you, what do you need to do? What, what are we trying to accomplish? Are we trying to generate leads? Are we trying to sell something, right? And then, and then begin to have that conversation, right? You know, and then, and then like some, some of the things that we talked about in the, in my little five-step process there, right? What kind of list? What kind of budget, right? But, but I think if you could start with one thing, and it sounds cliche, but man, I, I, I think we missed the boat in a lot of cases. What is the goal? What are we trying? And, and be specific. If it's a specific revenue goal, try and figure out, okay, we, this is going to be, you know, we're trying to generate X amount of dollars. Each transaction is X. Our audience size is Y. The, 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 you know, here's what we anticipate for response rate. You know, there needs to be some thought into that, right? But, I, but to me, it's planning. And what is the typical timeline for creating a new direct mail program? If the creative if the creative comes to us, in a lot of cases, we always joke around we could build a small city within a couple of weeks. Um, <laughs> just about any, you know, most direct mail of most any size we can get out within one to two weeks. And then if you're if you're smart and you want to save your marketing dollars and you can use a USPS marketing mail, you need depending on where it goes in the country. We've got ways of speeding this up depending on your list size and concentration, but just to be safe, add another two weeks. So to me, if you're going to hand a creative over, maybe four weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, if you need us to help you with a creative, maybe five to six weeks. Okay. Uh, and then Dennis, uh, do you feel that USPS informed delivery will drive marketers to use lower cost postage in some sizes, postcards rather than letter mail, and utilize the online ride along to drive their message online? Is this an unintended consequence of the informed delivery program where letter mail will decline as a result of this program? Hmm. I, that's a great question. I, I, I don't, I, I don't see it as a, I, I mean, if it does, so be it. I, I, I want my clients to be successful. You know yep. what I mean? Yep. Um, but I don't, I don't really see that being the case. I, I mean, if anything, it's going to make it more attractive because if the response rate increases, I don't think they're going to want or less want to offer less information. Yeah. I mean, that almost seems a little counter. It's a great question, but. It is a good question. Yeah, very thoughtful. Uh, Caressa is uh, clarifying here that with her company, uh, they generate leads with personalized direct mail, similar to what we're talking about. They add a unique pin to each mail piece, which the customer texts in. We capture the phone number and we set a lead to CRM, allowing immediate follow up by the advertiser. Wow, great job, Caressa. That's fantastic. Awesome. Yep. Uh, Jason, just, Jason, just, Jason just made a point here too about smaller postcards. Okay, that's something that we rarely recommend, and in, 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 you know, in any case, and the reason why is they get lost in the mail stack. Good, good. So, all right, go ahead. Uh, Dennis from Robin here. Robin is saying, do you suggest using a QR code instead of a pearl to make it easier for a client to get your to get to the personalized site from the direct mail? Uh, to me, when we use it, we use both. Okay. They've got, that way they've got the option, right? Okay. I mean, yep. because you got, to me, it's, it's, it doesn't take up much real estate and you got to kind of respect um, their right to choose how they want to respond. Yep. Robin, let us know if you have a follow-up question on that. Uh, Dennis, Steve is saying that he's going to steal your phrase, we can build a small city within a few weeks. <laughs> That's get, cool. Go right ahead. Yeah. Go right ahead. <laughs> we, we just never get a few weeks anymore. Like, exactly. You know? Yeah. So there's Dennis's uh, email. Uh, you can add to his five million open emails, <laughs> and, <laughs> and his uh, uh, phone number. And you can see my email and my phone number there as well. Uh, listen. So uh, next step to me, if you got questions, continue to follow up. Continue to ask Dave or myself. 
And, and Dave, great job today. Great information. And uh, this stuff always gets me excited to think about what's coming into your head. Absolutely. Thank you all for your time. Dennis, thank you for allowing me to speak to your audience today. Uh, thank you to everybody. Uh, I know it's a very busy time around the holidays so that you would you know, that you would spend 68 minutes with us is not insignificant. Dennis and I both appreciate that. And I look forward yeah. to talking to everybody soon. All right. Thanks, everyone. Happy holidays. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.